Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about the latest developments in the Hathras gang rape case. We also talk about a possible meet between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chinese President Xi Jinping. But first, we talk about the pandemic. For over a month now, India has been reporting more than 1,000 COVID-19 deaths every day. Last week, the COVID-19 related death toll in the country crossed the 1 lakh mark. As things stand, India accounts for nearly 10% of all COVID-19 related deaths in the world. Only the United States and Brazil have had more deaths. Many scientists and health experts also believe that deaths in India might be somewhat underreported. But no one is quite sure to what extent. In this segment, we speak to epidemiologist and president of the Public Health Foundation, Dr. Srinath Reddy, about what we have learned about the COVID-19 deaths so far, what predictions we can make about them in the near future, and more importantly, what can we do to prevent them? Well, we know that uh, deaths have actually increased as the cases have increased and the virus has spread to different parts of India from where it originated. And therefore, we are seeing many more parts of India now reporting both cases and deaths. So that's been one major change. The other big change, he says, is how the virus manifests itself in the body. Previously, it was thought that it's only going to be viral pneumonia or acute respiratory distress syndrome with the lungs actually being flooded with water and then not being able to really expand because of the severe immunological reaction and the leakage. And it was thought that these were the main reasons why people were dying. And the so-called cytokine storm in which the body's own immunological reaction can turn renegade and start attacking different parts of the body because it is indeed an excessive reaction. And while the virus seems to initially escape its effect, the body tissues actually get the brunt of the damage. And these were considered to be the main reasons. But now, apart from these, there are also other causes that are leading to COVID-19 deaths. We are seeing heart attacks. We are seeing strokes, uh, particularly even in the middle-aged people. We are seeing that as the presenting manifestation. We are seeing heart attacks as the presenting manifestation. We are seeing clotting in the blood vessels, which are either arteries or veins or both. And usually what's called microangiopathy, extending throughout the blood vessels, but also large clots in the large blood vessels, which can get dislodged from the veins and travel to the lungs and uh, seal off the circulation to the lungs. And that can cause uh, severe circulatory collapse and death. So now different manifestations are being noticed, partly because of greater awareness, but partly also because many more patients are getting admitted and we are seeing a variety of ways in which they are presenting. As per the latest serological surveys, a large part of the population in India continues to be susceptible to the virus. Serological surveys or sero surveys are supposed to find out how many people have already been infected by COVID-19. And the second nationwide sero survey revealed that only 1 in 15, that is only 6.6% Indians got infected by COVID-19 till August. That means the other 93% of the population can still potentially get infected, leading to more deaths. Plus, winter is soon approaching, a time when Dr. Reddy says that coronaviruses are known to spread a lot more. And we also know that even in terms of the host factors, the immunity levels generally go down in winter for most people because of a variety of reasons. And third, even in terms of environmental factors, apart from the cold weather itself, which gets much more damp, we know that pollution levels also increase in winter. Things like household fuel burning, industrial pollution and smogging will all put a burden on the respiratory system and further depress immunity, he says. And therefore, all the three factors, uh, the virus becoming more active, uh, the person also having lowered immunity, innate immunity, and third, uh, environmental factors also becoming adverse, all three can actually increase the risk of severe illness and death in winters. Therefore, we have to keep a watch for that. 
Now the question is, what can India do to reduce the number of COVID-19 deaths in the country? Dr. Reddy says that the answer lies in focusing on early detection of cases. A number of states have reported that a lot of deaths have been happening because COVID-19 patients come late to the hospital. And this, he says, is a failure of our primary healthcare system. Firstly, you should be able to detect people at the earliest stage of their symptoms. If you had primary healthcare teams supported by citizen volunteers as needed to visit homes and inquire if anybody has symptoms suggestive of COVID. And now we know that the symptoms are not just the three major symptoms of cough, breathlessness and fever, but there are about 10 to 11 symptoms which have now been recognized to be associated with COVID. A simple checklist of these to find out if anybody at home is having this would have actually unmasked the person who is affected at the earliest. This step, he says, is easy to accomplish. In villages, primary healthcare teams supported by volunteers can do it. The work of early detection, he says, is the kind that even a student of class 8 or 10 can do it. Then they could have been tested as soon as possible, either advised home isolation if they were mild, or taken to a hospital or sent to a hospital if the condition was deemed to be a little more serious. But even for those in home isolation, if the primary health care teams had kept track, particularly with both the temperature as well as pulse oximetry, to measure the blood oxygen saturation and to find out how well they are doing in terms of breathlessness and so on. If those teams could immediately arrange for a transfer of a person to an assured hospital admission, which has been pre-identified, and therefore the transport delays, the delays involved in uh, scurrying around, looking for different hospitals for admission, uh, and uh, the delay in reporting to the hospital in the first place if there is a serious condition, all of those could have been avoided. He says that the delays that we are talking about here are the same ones that are kept in mind during pregnancy. The first delay was the delay in recognizing the problem. Second is delay in transport. And the third is the delay in obtaining care when you reach the point of care. Uh, The same three delays apply even in COVID care. And there, the role of primary health care would have been absolutely critical. And in not strengthening primary health care right from the beginning, especially urban primary health care where this epidemic has begun, that is showing the problem of having neglected urban primary health care in our national health mission. So delayed recognition, delayed referral, delayed admission are major issues in not providing the right kind of care which could have saved valuable lives. The other thing to keep in mind, he says, are people with comorbidities. That is, people who have more than one illness at the same time. They are the ones who are at a higher risk of a complex COVID-19 case and death. If there are people who are either elderly or even middle-aged or younger people with high level of comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, or respiratory illness in the past, and uh, or cardiovascular disease in the past, then these are the kind of people who should be protected much more by fairly vigilant uh, evaluation of their risk factors and trying to shield them from getting into COVID exposure states. Right now, a big concern is of the virus spreading to rural areas. But Dr. Reddy says that while that is a concern, since the number of people are larger in villages and health facilities are poorer there, the number of people with comorbidities, however, are lesser there. Hypertension, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and chronic respiratory disease do exist even in villages and it's a growing problem, but still much less than in the urban areas. Therefore, if we are careful, firstly, in preventing the virus from getting speedily into rural areas, And secondly, if we can actually provide initial care uh, in the rural areas and arrange for quick transport if people deteriorate, then we may be able to actually have less than number of deaths per million in the rural areas. But even if we detect early and manage to not delay hospitalization, we should also be able to provide the right medical facilities. We may not be able to provide intensive care with ventilators everywhere, but that's not needed. We know that a very small fraction of people admitted even in the urban hospitals 
are really requiring ventilators. Slightly higher proportion require oxygen. Many others do well without even oxygen with just proning lying on the belly. But we ought to be able to ensure that at least oxygen supply is there in primary health care centers, community health centers, and other sub-district hospitals so that people don't have to go far at least to get oxygen. So these are the kind of emergency transport system should be there for transfer from villages to these centers and from these centers to city hospitals for the minority who get very sick. So unless we plan for all of these and then be prepared at the district level, and ultimately it is the district authorities who have to do all this detailed planning and ensure that uh, if anybody becomes serious, uh, the delays in transportation and the delays in administration of early care are greatly minimized. So these are the kind of steps that we do need to take in terms of preparing the health system better to care for the people who are more likely to be affected as the virus spreads deeper into the smaller towns and villages and farther into eastern India and other parts of India, which were less affected in the initial stages. The number of future COVID-19 deaths will also, of course, depend on how much the virus spreads and how much we are able to contain it. The stringent measures like the lockdown which the government took early on are no longer being imposed. More and more restrictions are being relaxed to tackle the economic crisis. And this, like mentioned earlier, is being done at a time when the majority of the population continues to be susceptible. So while the government can plan better for people who are likely to get severely sick and boost primary health care and medical facilities, there are also things that we as individuals would need to do. The two most important things are wear a mask and wear it properly. Because whether it is droplets or whether it is aerosols, whether it is young people who are carrying the virus into your homes or elsewhere or who are transmitting it actively or whether you are actually moving around to do your work, people are likely to be vulnerable if they allow the virus to enter through the nose through the mouth, or even the eyes. So do wear a mask. Do not neglect that part of it and wear it properly, not hanging down on your chin. The second is avoid crowds because we now know super spreaders spread the virus much more than others. In fact, it's only 5 to 20% in different instances who are responsible for 80% of the cases. Now, there's no way you can identify an asymptomatic person carrying a virus, whether he's a super spreader or not. There's nothing written on his forehead that he's a super spreader. On the other hand, if you avoid crowds and wear a mask, then you are less likely to be exposed to a super spreader. And therefore, super spreader events, which are gathering of crowds, especially indoors, but even static crowds outdoors, like demonstrations, shopping outings, political and religious gatherings, birthday or wedding parties. These are the kind of things that we must avoid at least till next March or April, till we are sure that the virus is on the wane. If we wear masks and avoid crowds, the risk of our getting infection is going to be much less. And of course, the other things like washing hands and ensuring that you are even in terms of uh, protected home environment, trying to keep some degree of physical distancing from visitors who are entering the house, like people who are delivering groceries or people who are coming to do household chores for you. Those are the kind of precautions that you must always take. But the two critical things, even if people have to remember, is avoid crowds, wear a mask properly. Dear listeners, sorry for this interruption, but before we move on to the rest of the show, I just wanted your quick attention. One of the big reasons people say they like this show is because it helps them understand the news better. It provides them with the context they need to see the bigger picture. And there is perhaps no other place that does that better than Indian Express's explained section. We on three things refer to the section regularly and it helps us make this show. If you're a regular reader of Indian Express, you know how useful the explained section can be, especially when you're looking for in-depth analysis by the right experts. You can log on to indianexpress.com slash explained and access the coverage 24-7. Explained by Indian Express, where news that matters is explained by experts who know the subject. 
Now, back to the show. And next, we talk about the Hathras case, where a 19-year-old Dalit girl from a village in the Hathras district of Uttar Pradesh was allegedly assaulted and gang-raped, which later led to her death. In previous episodes, we have talked about the case from the beginning, the UP police burning the girl's dead body without her parents' presence, and the state shutting the village down for the media and any outsiders. We have provided those links in the episode description. Now, among the many controversial and bizarre responses of the state was also a statement made last week by a senior Uttar Pradesh cop that claimed that according to a forensic report, the girl was not raped. Since then, Indian Express has learned more about this forensic report and the state's response to the case. In this segment, we talked to Jignasa Sinha, who has been reporting on the case since the beginning about these developments. Jignasa, one rather controversial thing that has been claimed by the Uttar Pradesh ADG Law and Order Prashant Kumar last week was that the 19-year-old girl at the center of this case was not raped. And he said that the Forensic Science Laboratory report says that. But since then, new information has come to light. You've written about it. Could you talk about what Kumar had said earlier and what have we learned now? So uh, on Thursday, Prashant Kumar, who's ADG Law and Order, he said that uh, as per the FSL report, that's the Forensic Science Laboratory report, no semen or sperm secretion was found in the viscera sample. He also cited the PM report and said that the cause of death was due to trauma caused by the assault and there was no rape. He was saying that all these statements have been given by the officials, but wrong information is being circulated by the media. That's what he said on Thursday in a PC. Now, what we've learned is this FSL test, uh, Forensic Science Laboratory test, was conducted on September 25th in Agra. The woman was raped 11 days before this, on September 14th in Hathras. She was then taken to a district hospital. From district hospital, she was referred to uh, Aligarh Muslim University, where she was treated for two weeks. And during this, on September 22nd, she regained consciousness and she told the doctors uh, that she was raped. The magistrate were called in and the woman recorded a statement saying that she was raped by four upper caste men and she was targeted because of her caste. This is what she told the magistrate. After this, the MLC was conducted. The MLC is the medical legal uh, examination. So after the MLC was conducted, the MLC report says that there are signs of use of force. And as per the statement of the woman, there is penetration in the vagina. But that's it. The MLC also says that we need a FSL report to confirm rape. So yes, after this, the samples were sent to FSL. They received it on September 25th. And their report does not mention presence of sperm or rape. So the UP police is heavily relying on this report. But what we have found is that doctors at AMU, they are saying that according to the government guidelines, FSL test should be conducted like within 96 hours of the incident. This is 11 days later. So how can the sperm survive? How can, you know, the samples will not show any result? So yeah, I mean, a lot of doctors said that the FSL tests, they're not reliable, they're bogus. The UP police should not use them and say that, you know, there was no rape because that's not fair. Also, uh, if you see the PM uh, post-mortem report from Savdar Jung, you find that her hymen did show multiple old healed tears. Even on her uh, anal injuries, there was some old uh, healed tear. So the doctors are saying that, you know, obviously there have been two weeks before this. Maybe her injuries were healed. These tests should have been conducted earlier. So yeah, the police should not rely on the FSL because it holds no value. That's what the CMO has told the Indian Express. And so now, you know, because like you mentioned that, you know, the UP government is playing this FSL up a lot. What kind of reaction has it caused in the state with the government, you know, sort of backing this report saying that, oh, look, this is a sign that there was no rape. So with senior police officials and government backing this report and relying on this, there are a lot of protests right now outside the village. The victim's family, they're scared because, you know, there are these upper caste men who are 
protesting then there are samajwadi party workers who are protesting there are rashtradal party members who are protesting there are a lot of these different groups that are protesting now some of them are clashing last night police had to intervene there was lathi charge so all this is happening because there are these multiple statements being given out by the police some saying there was no rape there was only assault the pm report does not state any rape so you know there's a lot of backlash because of this you know we have earlier on the podcast we had we have talked about the up government's response you know since this past week i mean there have been responses that have been extreme that have been bizarre you had the hurried um burning of the body without the presence of the family you had a two day siege where hundreds of police officers were guarding the area and no one was being allowed inside the village since that time of course people have been allowed and media has you know once again been allowed to talk to the family what has been the reaction of the state since then since then uh, after the media clamp down and now they've reopened the village there's still a heavy deployment of the police despite all these protests the police are trying to guard the village they are barricading the area uh, i mean yesterday bhim army chief chandrashekar azad he wanted to meet the family but the police they barricaded the entire area the roads were blocked they didn't let him enter here to walk 20 kilometers and then meet the family and now even like an fir has also been registered against him by the police the police said in the fir that uh, he and his supporters they created a law and order situation while they tried to enter the village the fir was filed under section 144 and the epidemic diseases act even a similar fir was registered against congress workers who were protesting at a uh, delhi up border in noida so the up police is taking this as a big thing they have also released a statement saying that this uh, case is like this is like an international plot you being used to instigate riots along caste lines and defame chief minister yogi adityanath and they've registered a case against sedition there's also a website they've stated in their fir which says that justice for hathras victim.com uh, this website is being used to give information to people to how protest to to how you know how to riot or and all this thing it has been linked to the, to some conspiracy that's what the police is saying as of now and you know you and our colleague uh, somel lakani did this sunday story where you wrote about you know who this 19 year old girl really was you spoke to the girl's family and a number of villagers could you share some of the things that have sort of you know stayed with you from this conversations that you had with people yeah well uh, one of the things that is uh, really shocked us is the caste divide i mean while the up police and the government are saying no this is all uh, conspiracies and there's nothing like that but we feel no there is the family they're very scared their neighbors other locals they are threatening them they are telling them that you know your daughter was not raped and you know hearing these statements is very hurtful for them obviously and looking at these protests is also hurtful they are scared of like when chandrashekar azad told them that would you like to leave with me you know you're not safe here the family was like yes we are ready to leave with you because they didn't seem happy here i mean when we spoke to the family they're still very upset about the hasty cremation which nobody is talking about they're upset about the rape they're upset about how the police is giving out these statements openly that you know no there was no rape there's no sperm secretion there's not this that so the family is very upset about all this even other locals you know who are dalits and from the Mal- valmiki samaj they don't feel safe now because obviously they're a minority so they don't feel safe they feel that after the media and the police leaves there will be some major fight and you know they'll be driven out of the village so yeah they don't feel safe uh, also when we spoke to the upper caste people these families they're very agitated they want the accused men to be released they don't want all four of them to go to jail and they are forcing family go for the narco analysis test let the cbi come why are you scared let, let the sit come why don't you want to share details and the family is like we are not scared of anything but we don't want to undergo na- narco test i mean we are the victims why do we have to go undergo such tests so yeah that's been the kind of reaction from both sides and 
the mother she's she's grieving she misses her daughter uh, every day she has to meet policemen authorities dm and nobody answers her question you know like where is her daughter she doesn't know the family still doesn't know the body that was burned that day was it their daughters or not and you know you also had rahul gandhi and priyanka gandhi meet the parents of the girl and there have been photographs with both of them that have been you know talked about a lot online has you know did that meeting give the parents any kind of confidence or assurance in this matter they were satisfied uh, they were not too happy with it because they want other people to support them as well they don't want only the congress to support them they also want pm and the chief minister support they want everybody to support them but they are, they did feel confident that big leaders like priyanka gandhi and rahul gandhi met them they spoke to them for an hour asked them about the details of the case they assured them that we will look into this matter we will help you we'll also help you with the legal counsel because so, so the thing is before this the family had been complaining that we don't have a lawyer in this matter no legal counsel has been provided to us so we really want that so the leaders they said that yeah we will help you with that and please don't worry you will get justice so the family was satisfied with the response and they said yeah we do feel that they will help us and in the end we talk about india's border crisis with china it has been nearly 5 months since the standoff between the two countries started along the line of actual control in eastern ladakh now for the first time amid the standoff prime minister narendra modi and chinese president xi jinping could have their first interaction during a virtual BRICS summit on November 17. BRICS is the acronym coined for the Association of Five Major Emerging Economies that apart from India and China include Brazil, Russia and South Africa. Russia, which currently holds the BRICS chair, yesterday announced the date of the 12th BRICS summit and its theme which is BRICS Partnership for Global Stability, Shared Security and Innovative Growth. Modi and Xi who have met at least 18 times in the last 6 years have not spoken to each other or met since the border standoff. No meeting or phone call between the two leaders is scheduled before November 17. Although sources have told the Indian Express that the possibility of a conversation could not be ruled out completely. As per Shubhajit Roy's report, sources said that the scheduling of the BRICS summit could be an opportunity to resolve the standoff. since the two sides would like to settle the issue before november 17 it is important to note that despite multiple military and diplomatic talks so far there have been no major breakthroughs and disengagement only limited both armies are preparing to dig in for the winter india and china have around 50000 troops each in the region along with additional artillery tanks and air defense assets India has been demanding a status quo ante that is for things to go back the way they were back in April. You were listening to 3 things by the Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me Shashank Bhargav and as always was edited and mixed by our producer Joshua Thomas. Before we go here's another reminder to check out Indian Express's explain section. You can log on to indianexpress.com/explain and find in-depth analysis by the right experts. It has everything you need to know to understand the news better and see the bigger picture. If you like this show then you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it, share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.